In our last video, we talked about classical conditioning, and today we are going to be focusing on operant conditioning as we explore Unit 4, Topic 3 of AP Psychology on the Mr. Sin channel. When talking about classical conditioning, we talked about condition stimulus and condition responses. Operant conditioning is all about consequences and their impact on a subject. B.F. Skinner, who was a behaviorist, first described operant conditioning, which is when a behavior becomes more likely to occur when a subject is reinforced and less likely to occur if there is a punishment. Skinner ideas used the work of Edward Thorndike as a starting point. Thorndike created an experiment where a cat was put into a puzzle box. When the cat was first put in the box, the cat would meow and scratch and dig and so on. But the box had a latch, and if the cat pushed on the latch, the box would open and the cat would be able to get food. As the experiment continued, the cats would no longer meow or scratch at the box. Instead, they would push the latch right away and get their reward, which was the food. This early version of operant conditioning became known as the law of effect which is when behaviors are followed by favorable consequences, they become more likely to occur. And when behaviors are followed by unfavorable consequences, they become less likely to occur. And I want to clarify that consequences can be good or bad. A consequence is simply a result or an effect of an action. Make sure you remember that. Many students associate consequences just with negative aspects, but consequences can be positive as well. For example, if you work hard at your job, you might get a promotion. That would be a positive consequence. While if on the other hand, you showed up late every day to work, you might get laid off. Off, and that would be a negative consequence. One of Skinner's most famous studies was the Skinner box, also known as the operant chamber. Skinner created a box that had a speaker, a light, a food dispenser, and a spigot for water and a lever inside it. Skinner would put an animal in the box to teach them to push down on the bar to get food. This is different from classical conditioning. Remember, classical conditioning is conditioning that has a response to a stimulus. Here, the goal was to get the animal to make a decision. Pushing down the bar is an active decision. Now, Skinner put a rat inside a Skinner box. At first, the rat would explore around the box and could have even bumped into the lever by mistake, which if the rat did, a pellet of food would be dispensed into the box. Skinner would use shaping, the process of reinforcing behavior that aligns with the desired outcome, to help train the rat to push the lever down for food. So for example, when the rat went towards the lever, the rat would get a food pellet. Then if the rat stood near the lever, the rat would get a food pellet. And eventually the rat would only get a food pellet when it pushed down on the lever. This lever in this case is known as a conditioned reinforcer, also known as a secondary reinforcer. This is a stimulus that gains its reinforcing power through association with a primary reinforcer. For this example, the food pellet would be the primary reinforcer. It is something that naturally gives satisfaction to the rat, whereas the lever does not naturally give satisfaction. Due to this, the rat must learn to associate the food with the lever to get satisfaction. The food pellet acts as a positive reinforcement. The rat is given the food pellet as a reward for doing the desired action. In this example, we can also see the lever is a discriminative stimulus, which is a stimulus stimulus that elicits a response after a reinforcement. Now, when the rat is given a food pellet, it is known as a positive reinforcement. This motivates the rat to press the lever again. When looking at operant conditioning, we can see that there is not just positive reinforcements, but negative reinforcements as well. And understanding the difference is crucial. Positive reinforcements add a desirable stimulus, which has the result of promoting or increasing a behavior, while negative reinforcements remove an undesirable stimulus, which has a result of promoting or increasing a behavior. Let's look at an example. Say you get a 100% on your test and your teacher gives you a gold star and an A, this would be a positive reinforcement since you're gaining a stimulus which will promote you to continue to study and work hard in your class. On the other hand, we could also look at a different example. Let's say that your class is behaving well and everyone is using their class time wisely. The teacher may drop a quiz or remove a homework assignment. This would be an example of a negative reinforcement. The teacher is removing a quiz or homework to reinforce the good behavior in the class. Let's do one more example. If you've ever played a mobile game, you've been impacted by Skinner's work and you've had positive and negative reinforcements used. For example, if you've ever played Clash Royale, you get positively rewarded when you contribute to your clan. If you donate cards to other players, you get coins and experience. That would be a positive reinforcement. Speaking of Clash Royale and other video games, many games today use intermediate or partial reinforcement schedules to increase the amount of time players play the game. But in order to understand which schedules are used, we have to go back to Skinner and his findings. Skinner looked at a variety of different intermediate or partial reinforcement schedules to see which would be the most effective at influencing a subject. Our first schedule is a fixed ratio schedule. This reinforces a response after a set amount of responses. For example, if you've ever had a punch card from a restaurant or a library and you get a free book or dessert after a certain amount of purchases, that would be a ratio schedule. It's great at getting a high number of responses in a short amount of time. We could also look at the private sector. Companies, for example, that want to motivate employees to quickly produce items
items or make lots of sales in a short period of time could use a fixed ratio schedule to motivate employees to increase their productivity. For example, a company could say for every 10 sales you get, you'll receive $100. That will motivate employees to quickly sell more product. Next is a fixed interval schedule, which reinforces a response after a set amount of time. For example, if you work at a traditional hourly job or salary job, you most likely get paid every two weeks. Here, it does not matter how much you produce or what you do, you still get paid every two weeks. With this type of schedule, we can often see more responses occur right before the payout occurs. For example, say a company gives an employee of the month award at the start of each month. Workers are more likely to work a little harder right before the end of the month to try and get the award. There's also variable ratio schedule. These reinforce a response of what appears to be a seemingly random amount of responses. We can see that this schedule produces a high amount of responses from an individual, since the individual will not know when they will be rewarded. Slot machines use this payout schedule to motivate people to put one more quarter into the machine. Every time you put another quarter into the machine, you get closer to the payout. But the problem is you have no idea when the payout will occur. So people will just keep playing, hoping that they will get the payout, because that next quarter could be the big win. The last interval schedule is a variable interval schedule, which reinforces responses after seemingly random amounts of time. This schedule traditionally produces a slow and steady response, since the individual has no way of knowing when the payout will occur. An example of this would be companies that use secret shoppers to come into the stores to give bonuses or gift cards to employees who are doing what they were supposed to be doing. There's no way for the employees to know when the secret shoppers will come into the store. So the employee is motivated to always be on task, but not motivated to increase the amount of sales or boost their productivity. Now there is also one more type of reinforcement schedule, and it is a continuous reinforcement. This is when reinforcement occurs after each desired response. This is great for quick learning, however, we can see that once the reinforcement stops, the behavior will soon stop after. Going back to our gaming example, we can see that games like Clash Royale utilize a variety of reinforcement schedules. The game uses continuous reinforcement schedules to give players a loot box every time they win a game. We can also see that to open the loot boxes, the game uses a fixed interval schedule, with having each box at a set time to give the reward. And once you open the box, the game uses a fixed variable ratio to randomly give the player different payouts for each box they open. The more boxes they open, the greater the chance of getting the top cards. Today, almost every video game uses different reward schedules to motivate players to keep playing longer and longer. Lastly, we can see operant conditioning also can use positive and negative punishment to reinforce and decrease behavior. Positive punishments are when an unpleasant, uncomfortable, or possibly painful stimulus is added, and the result is a decrease in the frequency of the undesirable behavior and an increase in the desired behavior. For example, if you are speeding down the highway, you may get a speeding ticket. Or if your cat climbs a Christmas tree, you may spray the cat with a bottle of water. In these examples, a negative stimulus is being applied to the situation to decrease people's speeding or the cat climbing the Christmas tree. The goal is to promote safe driving or to get the cat to leave the tree alone. Notice this is different from positive reinforcement, which adds a desirable stimulus. For positive punishment, we are adding a negative stimulus. Now, negative punishment is when a reward or a positive stimulus is removed, and the result is a decrease in the frequency of the undesirable behavior and an increase in the desirable behavior. For example, if a teacher takes a student's phone away in class who is not paying attention, notice that here a desirable stimulus is being removed due to the actions of the individual. The goal is to promote the student to focus on class. It's kind of crazy to think about just how many things in life influence your behaviors. Sometimes we do certain activities or have certain behaviors because we are intrinsically motivated. This is when we are motivated to better ourselves or to work on tasks without external reward. But we also do things because we are extrinsically motivated, which is when we perform certain tasks for a future reward, which is when we can see different reward schedules and punishments all have different impacts on our actions. And when classical conditioning and operant conditioning are used effectively, they will impact individuals and their behavior. One thing I want to highlight quickly is the more extrinsic rewards are used, the more at risk a person is for experiencing the over-justification effect which is when an extrinsic reward replaces intrinsic motivation. This causes the enjoyment of an activity to go down. And if the intrinsic reward stops, well, it's most likely the behavior will stop as well. For example, if your parents ever paid you to clean your room, you probably cleaned it pretty frequently. But as you got older, if your parents told you you're now old enough to clean your own room and you should want to do it on your own, we're not going to pay you anymore. You probably are going to start cleaning your room less frequently because you're no longer getting that extrinsic reward. And that's operant conditioning. Now you know the drill. Answer the questions on the screen and check your answers in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to check out the Ultimate Review Packet. It is a great resource which covers every single unit of AP Psychology. It'll definitely help
help you get an A in your class and also a five on that national exam. As always, I'm Mr. Sin, and until next time, I'll see you online.